Welcome to Dakar Senegal. A little bit longer of a video since we're comparing three flights in the price of one video. Today we're going to be hopping on board the Ethiopian Airlines 787s, both the Dash 8 and Dash 9 variants, comparing their Cloud 9 business classes, flying from Dakar Senegal to Bamako, Mali, from there on to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and then transiting down to Johannesburg, South Africa shortly thereafter. Sorry for no post last week, I was actually on a family vacation out in Ireland, so on that note, stay tuned for an Aer Lingus business class video coming up soon. Now here at Dakar Airport, once you're inside, you have to head through an initial passport check to get onto the ticket counters. They do have a business class lane, however, unfortunately, that was closed today. Even still though, it didn't take long for me to go over to the Ethiopian counter, walk straight up to the counter where there was no line, get my bag checked, and head off to immigration. Immigration here also has a business class lane, however, unfortunately, that was closed for today. That being said, the normal lines, as you can see here, weren't all that long, so it only took me a couple minutes to get through immigration and security, then on through the mandatory duty-free store before making it out into the small terminal in Dakar, Senegal. The Dakar airport isn't all that big, having about 8 to 10 gates in total, although actually I've only seen about 3 to 4 of them occupied at a time. But it really is just one long corridor with some restaurants and shops, and they do have a lounge actually at each end. The Odyssey Lounge unfortunately is under renovation at the current time, so the Top Copy Lounge is where we're off to to start our journey today. If you've seen my Air Senegal video, this might seem familiar to you. The Top Copy Lounge is a contract lounge, and if you're traveling on any of the carriers here in business class, or if you're a priority pass holder, then this is the lounge that you're going to have access to here in Dakar. Now the lounge here isn't the nicest in the world, and it's not the biggest in the world either. But in all honesty, there's not that many people flying business class out of here at any given time, so I've never seen it completely full. But it does at least have comfy seats, place to charge your device, a private bathroom, and free food. Of that free food, I was able to get this shot of the sandwiches before being told I could not film the rest of the food, which really was just fruit, cheese, and quick grab options, which I was able to get a shot at least of the plate that I grabbed. Now this is actually the new Dakar Airport. The old one was actually pretty much right in the middle of the city, which was awesome for people visiting the city or the diplomats, which is a pretty common thing in this area. The new airport is about an hour drive outside the city without traffic, so the people in the city were pretty upset at the location for this new airport. However, if you're pretty much going anywhere except for the actual city of Dakar, it's much easier to get there in Senegal from this airport. But that does mean that it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, which you were able to see out the window as the sun finally began to come up. Still though, the main sight out the window was my Ethiopian 787-9 that had actually arrived the night before from Bamako and was getting ready to be towed over to our gate. I was out of gate number one today, which meant that I had a great view from my window in the lounge to watch my airplane be towed all the way in. Now this bird walking around my feet was perfectly timed to trigger me to head out into the rest of the terminal so I could finally board my flight. Upon leaving the lounge, since I was at gate number one, all I had to do was leave the lounge and turn left and I was already at my gate. Couldn't have been any easier. Here you can see the list of departures from Dakar. This is pretty much for the entire day. So you can see there really isn't all that many flights, which makes sense why the lounge and the airport never get too crowded. In order to help find your gate, they have this wonderful sign that I wish had existed in more airports in the US where you can see all the gates and exactly which airplanes for which flights are at which gates. Now, as seems to be pretty normal in this part of the world, they didn't really call for business class boarding, they kind of just called for boarding for the flight in general, and everyone seemed to bum rush the front of the line. Now, luckily I was nearby, and so it was pretty easy for me to be one of the first few people on board still, making it so that once I was on board, I was able to get a little bit of content before the plane filled up and it felt like I was shoving my camera in people's faces. Now, as I approached the airplane, I also was getting a little anxious thinking about the last time that I flew Ethiopian Airlines. Now if you follow my channel, you've probably seen the Ethiopian Airlines economy class video that I released last year, where I had a little bit of concern about the economy cabin, so I was really curious to see what the business class cabin is like. Starting off, this flight's going to be on the 787-9 on our flight to Bamako, continuing on to Addis Ababa. The 787-9 is actually in a 1-2-1 configuration, which is different than the 787-8 that we'll see later on. 
Now the setup of the business class here on Ethiopian 787-9 is similar to that of American Airlines, which I've actually only flown once in business class, but in the sense that there's not seats closer or further from the windows. If you're in a window seat, every seat's pretty much designed equally. For those of you that are traveling with someone else, they do have the seats in the middle next to each other. There's a privacy partition in the middle as well as an additional privacy partition that slides out. So they're not the closest seats as far as traveling with a partner, but you can at least sit next to someone, I guess, if you're traveling with them. As far as the seat went, I definitely prefer the nice red of the business class seat over the weird yellowish greenish color that they have throughout the economy cabin. We also were supplied with this nice pillow and a nice green blanket as well. And now just walking around the seat, obviously in front of us, first things first, we have the seat back TV. Right underneath that is where you find the tray table, and below that is the footrest, with some space below it in case you are trying to store some personal item that you have with you. There's also a coat hook on the seat back in front of you, and immediately to your right is where they have this little storage cubby, which opens up. It's not huge, but I use it to mostly store my chargers and stuff like that. It also can be raised and lowered with the pull of this lever here, which is nice if you're going to be laying flat or whatnot so that you can have it a little bit closer to you or used for more privacy. As far as privacy goes, there is this partition protecting you from the aisle, not the most private thing in the world, but I couldn't see others and they presumably couldn't see me. Over my left shoulder is where we see a reading light that opens up and it also can be rotated and immediately to my left is where we find the main counter and some more storage for the seat as well. We're also going to find the hard literature pocket over here, which is storing a lot of the seatback literature that they give you with the seat, including their Sheba magazine, which is pretty much just duty-free shopping, a safety card, and along with that is the barf bag as well. That literature pocket is also a great place to store my laptop, so with my charger stored and my laptop here, it kept the seat pretty clean. Also with this cubby, you can see it was a little broken, a little wonky, and so I chose not to use this one throughout the flight. It's also a little bit small, so I wasn't quite sure exactly what I would keep in there anyway. But just in front of that was the main cubby. This one was much bigger, could store a lot more stuff. It was also home to a few things like the CPAC TV remote, which was touchscreen and could pop out, a universal charging port, as well as the universal headset port, and two USB ports as well. Now the seat back controls here on this nice little touch screen where you can adjust each item individually or visit a few preset modes as well. Last but not least, the tray table slides out pretty easily here with just the pull of this little tab and it slides right on down. You can also fold out so if you do have a full meal or if you're trying to get some work done, you do have that for you as well. Now unfortunately, the Ethiopian Airlines 787 bathroom suffers the big white box phenomenon where they have nothing special going for it, not even a special floor, wall, or lighting. Pretty much exactly the basic standards you'd expect for an airplane bathroom. They did offer a moisturizing lotion and a cologne that were Ethiopian Airlines branded, but that was about as personal as it got. They also offered us these almost completely dry but hot towels before we took off which, like I mentioned, were dry, but at least they had the Ethiopian logo on it, which was kind of a nice touch. While the rest of the passengers boarded, they also came around and passed out these amenity kits. First thing that was kind of nice was this hook, which was nice if you needed to hang it in the bathroom of the hotel or lavatory on the airplane. The contents inside of it were pretty basic. The sock and eye mask that you'd expect with the earplugs, a hairbrush and a toothpick, you got the dental kit and a face mask, along with lip balm, hand sanitizer, and an Ethiopian Airlines branded pen as well. Now as far as the Seatback TV goes, it's got pretty much the same basic categories that they all have, such as movies, TV shows, audio, games, and your map, as well as some other features that actually weren't working too well on today's flight. Now honestly, where I feel like they really thrived as far as their entertainment goes is their movies. Now obviously Ethiopian Airlines flies to six of the seven continents. They fly to so many countries, so many different languages, and they do a really good job of having movies in a ton of those languages. So they have a wonderful selection, and even just in English selections, there is plenty for me to watch. If you watch my channel, you know that I like the Harry Potters just because of how much time they can kill. They did have all eight Harry Potters, so I was able to watch a couple of those to really pass the time on today's flights. Where they unfortunately suffered, however, was in their TV shows. They didn't have a ton of TV shows, especially TV series, where they didn't really have the stuff you'd normally expect, especially within the comedies, but at least the TV shows that they did have, they had a few episodes from the same season, so you could watch a few progressions of a story play out at least. 
The audio selection was also pretty good. I was impressed by the audio selection they had from around the world in different countries. So honestly, if you're trying to listen to music, my guess is you'd be able to find something to listen to. Now, personally, I didn't use the games on today's flight, but I did like the selection they had. So especially if you're traveling with kids or you're just in kind of a playful mood, they do have some good stuff for you here. Now, like I mentioned, there were a couple things that weren't working, like the connected tab, for example, here, which never actually loaded anything. There was also the food menu that was supposed to pull up a QR code, but unfortunately, that QR code also never showed up. They did have this nice section on the Seatback TVs that you'd usually find in this literature magazine with the seat that talks about the airline, it talks about the fleet and their destinations. They put it all on their Seatback TV, and so I did spend some time clicking through that, and it was a fun way to learn about Ethiopian Airlines, their fleet, and their destinations. And whatever company makes this specific Seatback TV map is doing it right. I actually took this shortly after departure, but I love this style of map and I'm happy Ethiopian has it. They have a ton of different flight information you can get, a ton of different views you can get, and it's all interactive so you can move around the map, you can zoom in or out, and it's great to be able to adjust that much. Now in order to listen to all this, we were given these headphones. Unfortunately, they weren't the most comfortable headphones, and also unfortunately, the noise cancellation portion of my headphones was inoperative today. You also have the Seatback TV remote, which pops out of the cabinet here. You can pull it out, and it does have these buttons to control the Seatback TV screen or sort through the options. It's nice, especially if you're in a reclined position, so that you don't have to sit all the way up and touch the Seatback TV screen. A real true first world problem. Then it was time to connect to the Wi-Fi. Now, the Seatback TV and signs around the cabin all mentioned that they had Wi-Fi on board this flight. However, no matter how long I waited, either on the ground or in flight, I wasn't actually able to find an internet to connect to. Now, I would love to say this is a one-off instance. However, on my last Ethiopian Airlines flight from Buenos Aires to Sao Paulo, Brazil, it was the same thing. They marketed the Wi-Fi like crazy, but when it came down to it, you weren't actually able to connect to the Wi-Fi. So hopefully this is an issue that Ethiopian can fix going forward. Shortly after takeoff, I took a look through the menu that they handed out, which was separated up by flight. They had the Dakar to Bamako leg as well as the Bamako to Addis Ababa leg. All in all, we had about nine and a half hours on this airplane, and so it was nice to have the selection for the entire thing. After that, there was one more page as well that showed the bread and dessert selection that was also available on board. Now where Ethiopian Airlines really thrives is their beverages. 
you can see here a full page describing the Ethiopian coffee style as well as the soft drinks, beverages, teas, and coffees. Some great stuff. And then the next page continues to go on about all of the wine selection. You can see they have red wine, white wine, and champagne. A great selection of that. And one more page exposes even more dessert wines and the harder alcohol they had on board. So whatever you're looking to drink, I promise you, you can probably find something on Ethiopian. Now it wasn't long after departure before they started prepping us for the meal service considering it was only a two hour flight. Since it's a smaller meal I decided to keep my table folded in half so I could keep it a little bit further away from me and free up some more space for my legs. For this first course I went with a coke which I usually don't do this early in the morning and I went with a nice fish and chicken skewer. Honestly the chicken skewer was one of the better breakfasts that I've had on board an airplane. Because of how short this first leg was, however, it wasn't long before we had begun our descent into Mali, pretty much right after they had collected our meal. After a couple hours after departing Senegal, we had arrived in Mali. Now interestingly enough, as a US citizen, Mali is one of the countries that's fairly hard to get a tourist visa for, so I wasn't sure if I'd ever be able to come back to Mali, so I figured I'd enjoy it while I could. But that being said, I wasn't actually ever going to be getting off of this airplane, and that's because of the fifth freedom. Now, Ethiopian Airlines is the fifth freedom king of the skies, basically means that we operated one flight that was between two countries not home to the airline. Basically, Ethiopian Airlines is based in Ethiopia, but we flew it from Senegal to Mali. So customers can book either or of these two legs, or, like I'm doing, they can get on in Senegal, continue through Mali, and end up in Addis Ababa. Ethiopian Airlines uses this in pretty much every continent of the globe. But that meant that while some of the passengers got off here in Mali, I was able to sit in my seat for about an hour, hour and a half while we waited for the passengers to board for the next journey and we could head off for lake number two. Now the crew was pretty much busy the entire time, both cleaning up from our inbound flight from Senegal and preparing for our outbound flight out to Ethiopia. I was able to get a bottle of water from them just because I was getting thirsty. I noticed, interestingly enough, that about 50% of the passengers in the business class cabin at least got off in Mali and were replaced by other passengers going on to Ethiopia, whereas the other 50% were pretty much continuing for the entire journey just as I was going to be doing today. But after sitting at the gate for a little over an hour, we pushed back, taxied out to the runway for our second of the two legs out to Ethiopia.
After departure, they did tell us that it would be a little while before they would get the full meal service to us, so they gave us these nice crunchy little bread snacks while we all watched our movies, and shortly after came by with a quick beverage service, of which I decided to try out this renowned Ethiopian coffee that they raved about in the menus. And for my first course, I decided to go with the chicken dish, which came with a little chicken salad and a side salad, as well as a piece of bread. I also decided to go with a glass of champagne, considering it was officially the afternoon, meaning that it's time for champagne. For the entree, I originally ordered the chicken option, which they had ran out of, so I decided to go with the fish, which was a little overcooked, which is pretty normal on airplanes. But the shrimp with a nice touch and the rice was cooked absolutely perfectly and spiced wonderfully. All in all, I definitely enjoyed the meal that I was served on this flight. The meal, however, was overshadowed by the star of the show, the dessert cart, which was full with cakes, cheese, and fruits. A great way to cap off this great meal. I wasn't really in the mood for a cake this early in the day, and although the cheese really looked good, I'm a sucker for a good fruit platter, so that's what I ended up ordering, and it was a great way to finish my lunch. The dessert cart was followed up by the dessert drink cart, which came with a selection of different dessert drinks like dessert wines and Irish coffees. Because of how early I woke up to make it to the airport for this flight, I decided I would get a little bit of sleep before we arrived in Ethiopia and I had my connection on to my last flight of the day to Johannesburg. Now the seat itself is actually super comfortable and makes a great bed. The pillow also has some nice substance to it. My only real comment on the bed here is the blanket, which is unfortunately just feels a little bit warm. I personally felt that the footrest had a good amount of space. You can see here I'm able to move my feet around, point them up, left, right, and still had plenty of space to get comfortable. After sleeping for about four to five hours, they came by with a pre-arrival beverage choice. I decided to go with another glass of that Ethiopian coffee, which really isn't served all that warm, interestingly enough. They also gave us these pre-arrival truffles, which were a super great touch, and I ate them as we made our descent into Addis Ababa. Now our arrival into Addis Ababa was fairly interesting, not only because we got to watch the sunset out of this window, but also because as you can see there was a large number of thunderstorms scattered all throughout Ethiopia on our arrival path. The captain and ATC did a wonderful job of guiding us around them and surprisingly actually we had an extremely smooth arrival into the airport. With that, welcome to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the hub of Ethiopian Airlines, the capital of the country of Ethiopia, and also their largest airport as well. Ethiopian Airlines obviously has a very large presence here as one of the cornerstones of African aviation as they connect to pretty much the entire rest of the world. It was hot, humid, and wet as we arrived at not only one of their many gates, but specifically one of their many hard stands, meaning that rather than get off on a jet bridge and into the terminal, we instead get down the stairs and onto a bus. 
There's mixed feelings on hard stands. Some people love them and hate them. However, I personally have gotten a ton of them this year, and I've come to dislike them for the sole purpose that, especially on short connections, it takes so much longer to get to and from the airplane, and if you're trying to enjoy the lounge, it also takes away from the time that you have for that. Now, Addis Ababa is largely just a transit hub. What that means is that there's not a whole lot of people starting or ending their journey here, but rather most of the people that are here are coming from somewhere else transiting onto other places, just like I'm going to be doing today, getting on board here from Senegal and going through Addis Ababa on my way to South Africa. They do have some good stuff set up for those people, including here the Ethiopian Skylight Hotel, which is inside immigration, so if you have an overnight connection, you can stay here and not have to worry about leaving immigration. Speaking of immigration, for those transiting, there is no immigration for you, there's just a security checkpoint, and then it's easy heading just up the escalator and you're back into the main part of the terminal. Now one of the things that I've noticed is that it always seems to be packed in this terminal. Maybe I'm just always there at the wrong time. My assumption, however, is because they fly to six different continents, they're flying to a bunch of different time zones, meaning that the airport pretty much always has to be running. Now here they actually have two lounges. The first thing you're going to find is their Sheba Cloud 9 lounge. This is the bigger and nicer of the two lounges, however you have to be on a Star Alliance business class ticket in order to access this. Alternatively is the Sheba Platinum lounge. This is for Star Alliance Gold members who maybe are on an economy ticket. When you first enter the lounge, you see this nice little coffee room. They do have an area set up for you to get coffee. I couldn't tell if I was supposed to serve myself or not, so I just ended up not having any, which I do kind of miss out on. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to tell if it was Arabic coffee or Ethiopian coffee or what, but it did look to be pretty nice. Now because there's so many people in this lounge, they have a ton of space, and these signs around the lounge help you find what you need. As you pass on the main hallway, you'll see all these areas like this room off to my right, which are areas that aren't the main dining room, but do offer a little bit more of a private feeling so that you don't have all of these people gathered in one large space. It does help to give it a little bit more private of a feel for groups. Now, in addition to the main dining room at the far end of the floor, they do have these smaller little enclaves that do have food and drink. So they do have that bar that you just saw. This is another one of those little dining rooms off to the side. However, this one's actually connected to another little buffet. Once again, separate from the main dining room, but if you are just looking for a smaller snack or a salad, this is a great place for you to hang out separate from the rest of the people. As far as relaxing and refreshing go, they do have this massage room, although there was nobody actually manning the counter at that time. It looked like you could go grab someone, however, and across from that was actually where you find the main shower rooms. This I did take advantage of. I was able to get a shower with only about a 5-10 to 10 minute wait. Not the biggest shower room in the world. Unfortunately, my biggest complaint is that these rooms were like a million degrees hot. It just felt like I was sweating even after I got out of the shower. So it wasn't exactly the most fresh feeling getting out, even though I know that I obviously was much fresher than when I got into the shower. At the far end of the hallway, however, after my shower, I took a stop by the main dining room. You can see there's a ton more seating here, all around the sides with couches, tables, and all kinds of stuff. In the center, you're going to have this main chandelier, which was gorgeous. It also had the tree underneath it that was up on a little stand. Roped off on the rest of the people, but it served as a wonderful centerpiece for the rest of this dining room. Now this lounge unfortunately is lacking in its views, maybe just because it was nighttime here, but the views here didn't seem to be really of the airport as much as it was a parking lot and an access road. And around the corner, connected to that same dining room here, you see a ton more seating. Couch style, table style, really depending on how big your group is, you can find a spot for you guys to sit. At the far end of that, there's also a couple extra rooms. For example, you can see first off is the media room. In there, they do have the main TV and little theater style set up so that you can have stuff on. This was mostly playing soccer or football for most of the time we were there. Next to that was the lounging room, where most people were here taking advantage of the loungers to take a nap on their overnight layover. What I will say is that the food in this lounge was incredible in my opinion. They not only had African cuisine, but all types of African cuisines. There was plenty of Ethiopian stuff, but other stuff from around Africa. There was also some other food around the buffet that was inspired by Western cuisines or Asian cuisines, Latin cuisines, pretty much everything. Once again, considering how many different places that Ethiopian Airlines flies to, it makes sense that they'd have so many different options.
All of that was of course wrapped up with the dessert platters off to the side with fresh fruits, cakes, and desserts alike. I will say also that that other smaller buffet off to the side of the main hallway did have slightly different options, slightly healthier options it felt like, at least with a lot more salads and quick grab options like that. But my time in the lounge had wrapped up after being here for a couple hours it was time to head out to my gates where of course I was at yet another hard stand, meaning that I had to get on another bus to go out to my next plane as well. Now the hard stands here are mostly out of the sea gates, meaning that I had to head over to the sea gates and down the escalator to the bus gates. You can see here just the sheer amount of people this place was packed and moving around was near impossible. Having to carry my bag everywhere was a pain in my ass. Now considering they were still boarding the flight prior to mine out of my gate, I decided that I would wait anywhere but here for them to board my flight just considering how crowded that it was. Luckily, in my exploration waiting for boarding, I found out that there was a bus gate specifically for Cloud9 business passengers and Star Alliance Gold passengers. This was a little bit more comfortable, unfortunately, there just wasn't a ton of seating. So I was able to wait here, but I wasn't really able to sit down until after they had boarded a flight. Even still, I gave up my seat to someone who needed it a little bit more than me, so I only really got to sit here for about 10 minutes. Eventually I headed down the elevator, got on the bus specifically for business class passengers on my flight, which eventually drove us out to our airplane that we could get on board. Now something that drives me crazy about these airports, about the bus gates for business class passengers specifically, is that a lot of these airports board business class passengers last, and I'm assuming it's so that they can get on board, the doors can shut, and the plane can leave. It minimizes their waiting time on board. However. I have a pretty comfortable seat on this airplane and personally I would want to get on board so that I can start enjoying the seat, settling in, and especially for the pre-departure beverages and whatnot. Especially when I have to film content, it bugs me when I have to be the last person on board. Now obviously you can board with the economy people and sometimes there's nothing wrong with that. However, in this specific airport, just because of how crowded it was, I just didn't feel like doing that and I feel like if it weren't a bus gate, the experience might have been slightly different. Now a special livery is always fun. Today we had the Star Alliance livery on our flight out to Johannesburg. Now keep in mind that we're now on the 787-8, which is a different business class setup than the 787-9. This one's actually in a 222 setup. In my opinion, I feel like it's much worse, but it's still a lie flat seat, so it's much better than any economy seat that you're gonna find at the very least. I was here at the back of the cabin, and fortunately, actually, the seat next to me remained open. When I got into my seat, the first thing I noticed is that the seat back TVs had completely messed up and weren't actually showing anything except an error message. Now because we boarded so late, of course the first thing they did when we sat down was bring us our pre-departure beverages, for which I went with a nice glass of champagne before examining the seat, and realizing that actually the seat itself is very similar to that that I had on my last flight. The look and feel of it was pretty similar, we had the same pillow and the same blanket. Only thing different is I had a seat neighbor. Like I mentioned, at least mine was empty. My curse of missing windows also continued on this flight, so both a hard stand and a missing window. This one not even seat guru could tell me about. Between the seats there is a privacy partition in addition to the seats being slightly offset to offer a little more privacy. The literature pocket here also had some stuff, pretty much the same stuff we had on the last flight as well, except they do have this little cubby here which could store pretty much a phone or a laptop but not much else. In front of that's where we find the Seatback TV remote, which looks old and somewhat damaged, and it unfortunately didn't work all that well for me. Some of the buttons just weren't working on my flight. It also looks like it's about 50 years old. The seat controls here, I will say, were kind of nice considering you could adjust the pieces individually, so that's something that you don't even have on some of the newer airplanes. They did have this little tray table here in between which could hold the beverages, the hot towel I was given, and my passport and boarding pass, which I shortly thereafter put in my bag. Just below that is where the tray table comes out of, where it pops right out of the armrest and slides out. It was just super loud, so every time I opened my tray table, it just seemed to be super loud, a problem that other seats didn't seem to have. Directly in front of you is the Seatback TV screen, and below that's this little cubby which they stored the complimentary headphones in. It's a nice cubby, however anything there for takeoff and landing is just going to fly right out anyway. Below that is your leg rest with a little bit of space underneath it to store personal items. However, there was so little space there that I kept my bag in the overhead bins anyway. The armrest to your right side doesn't have storage like the last flight, however it does still raise up and down to give you a spot to rest your arm. And in the weirdest storage location on board an airplane, much like what we found on Avianca, the storage is over your right shoulder in this little cubby behind you. 
They did have a water bottle. They also had charging ports and your headset jack here. It's just in such a weird accessible spot where the charging cord pretty much has to run completely across you in order to charge your phone if it's in your lap. The best feature, however, was the overhead individual air vents, as I've mentioned, something that's not guaranteed on today's flights, however, something that is greatly appreciated by those who love them. My favorite site as we taxied out was this Air Tanzania 787. I actually had a flight booked on that from Dar es Salaam to Guangzhou, China. However, it was canceled by the airline and I took the refund rather than rebooking it. That flight now seems to have been canceled. So I guess we'll have to put that in the bucket list for the future. Because it's a new flight that also meant we had some new choices as far as food goes on the menu so it was fun looking through this they had similar explanations of different Ethiopian cuisines and whatnot but the food was noticeably different on the flights to Johannesburg as compared to the flights from Senegal and Mali And because this was a longer nighttime flight, they also gave us these stickers that basically told them to wake us for meals, duty free or not at all. So you could put this on your seat and the flight attendants walking by knew whether or not to wake you as they came through the cabin. They also passed out the amenity kits. Now the amenity kits they passed out for the second flight were exactly the same as the amenity kits they gave us on the first flight. The only difference is these ones were yellow as opposed to red. So now I've got one in each color, I guess. And in miracles of all miracles, I was able to connect to the in-flight Wi-Fi on Ethiopian Airlines for the first time on my four separate Ethiopian Airlines flights. I was able to purchase a full flight pass for about 25 US dollars, and it wasn't the fastest thing in the world, but at this point, I was just completely astounded to have actually reached the internet service that at this point, I had completely believed to be a myth. Shortly after connecting, they came by with some food options. I actually decided to go with some chamomile tea, considering that after arrival, my plan was to go directly to sleep. Now the food on this flight was honestly some of the best airplane food that I've had to date. I went with the chicken starter which came with the chicken that was seasoned wonderfully. The side salad was wonderful and the salad that was with the chicken had this nice dill sauce to it that was fantastic. Then as far as the entree goes I went with this like Swahili fish dish with rice and veggies and the, once again the fish was just cooked wonderfully. Then I came with the dessert, they had chocolate cake. This flight I decided I would finally get my cake. The cake was okay, honestly the starter and the entree made the flight though. Now maybe my Ethiopian Airlines economy flight was just kind of a one-off thing, but I was starting to think that Ethiopian Airlines, at least in business class, was wonderful. Until we hit a breaking point. The in-flight charging port stopped working, so my laptop that I had been working on all flight slowly died its inevitable death. Switched to my CPAC TV, which shortly after there stopped working again, and they had to reboot it actually a few times before it finally started working. By the time they finally got it all working, the lights had come on and we had begun our descent into Johannesburg, so at least I got to enjoy my movie for the last 30 or 45 minutes of the flight.
Welcome to Johannesburg, South Africa. After three flights, two airplanes, and one airline, I finally am at the place of my hotel room where I can get some sleep, but not before giving my final thoughts on Ethiopian Airlines business class. Now we had a great time comparing the two different 787 products. If you're on the 787-9, you've got the 121 setup. If you're on the 787-8, you've got the 222 setup. Luckily, the soft product is amazing throughout. I thought the crew was great, the food was some of the best I've had on board an airplane, and that's not just because I'm hungry while I'm filming the voiceover. And the seats themselves were actually pretty comfortable. Obviously, the 787-9 has a far better product, considering that you can have a single window seat without a neighbor to have to climb over every time, and everything's just a little bit newer and fresher on those. So if you are able to book a flight on a 787-9 versus the Dash 8, I highly recommend that. I haven't flown their A350s, although from seat maps it looks like they are in the 222 setup that the 787-8 is in, although that could just be outdated. I will keep that in my future bucket list, but if you know about the Ethiopian A350, go ahead and let me know down in the comments. I will say that I've also flown Ethiopian in economy class, and if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. And the economy class doesn't even compare to the business class of Ethiopian Airlines. I thought the economy class was a very subpar experience, whereas the business class experience with Ethiopian Airlines was wonderful, and in all honesty, I would definitely do it again. But until next time, safe travels, and I'll see you guys later.